Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our third in the series of Not All Wounds Are Visible, a community conversation. We're here this morning to talk about anxiety and depression, particularly as it relates to women, children, and the family. This is in part a two-part series. Uh, the second portion will be on November 28th, and that will be a focus on men, elders, and the impacts of chronic disease on depression and anxiety. We have quite a great program planned for you this morning. I want to uh, advise everyone that you can go on the website and obtain all of the presentations, which is ums.org slash community health. In your packets today, there is a page summary for each of those presentations. And on the back of the event schedule, you will see the biographies for each of our speakers. So we may as well get started. And we let me first tell you what the topics are for today, just as a refresher. Depression and anxiety, a social cultural perspective, followed by childbirth, parenting, and depression. After a short break, we'll come back to growing up in fear, the impact of community violence and police interaction. And then we have a special presentation entitled One Woman's Story. And this will be a dialogue with one of our uh, employees here within the medical system who has graciously agreed to share her journey with depression over the last 30 years. And then we'll follow and end with resilience and recovery. I also want to encourage you to visit some of the exhibitors in the hallway who are direct service providers that are happy to speak with you. So the first presentation this morning will be depression and anxiety, a socio-cultural perspective, and that will be presented by Dr. Jacqueline Duval Harvey, who is the Deputy Health Officer for the Department of Health in Prince George's County. Welcome, Dr. Harvey. Good morning, everyone. So I hope um, this will be an interactive presentation. Um, my plan is to go over some basic information so that people who are not necessarily familiar with mental health or the history of psychology and psychiatry will have some context. Uh, but we're going to try to get through those very quickly. And then we're going to talk about the vignettes, because I'm hoping that those will make it real in terms of understanding what mental illness looks like in everyday life. Now, clearly, we're not going to use real people. As you see from the summary, we've used characters from television. And of course, because we're focusing on women, um, I particularly chose these characters because they are the central characters in the series. And everyone else is a backdrop in terms of the men, the children, and everyone else. So I think it's important, and there's a significant diversity in the portrayal and the issues that these women experience. And so I think this will be a really good opportunity for us to be able to talk about it. Hopefully you know these characters. Um, if not, um, we can fill in and those in the audience who do have information can talk a little bit more about what they know. So as we go along, because we are all adult learners, um, you have the summary sheet. You can start jotting down some of the questions that we have in terms of what trauma or issues these characters have experienced and what you think about their coping, but we'll focus on that towards the end. So generally, again, because you know, we are in a university setting, we want to make sure people understand what we're going to be focusing on. So we're going to talk about the social and cultural context of trauma, of depression, and anxiety, and uh, the, the impact of that on emotional development and I'm not going to focus on this because we have another present, uh, presentation on coping and strengths and resources. But we want to just generally highlight that to have a full context. Um, and we'll talk about how depression and anxiety manifest in daily life. Now, I'll just tell you, <clears throat> I think whatever happens to us on a daily basis, what is driving some of our challenges is really about e us either being depressed or being anxious. We know that um, from a prevalence point of view, anxiety and depression are the most common. Obviously, there's an issue of severity, and there's an issue of coping in terms of how those things become more serious. But on a daily basis, we will ex experience some anxiety and some depression in our daily lives. Um, 
I might feel extremely anxious standing in front of you. And if this was my daily job, I would certainly have to get some help to make sure that I can do this well. It's not, so I can manage doing it on an occasional basis. I might, I might have something stressful going on in my life. We all have loss. We have all kinds of things that happen. So depression is not something that necessarily is something that may result in a suicide. But if we're not paying attention to things as they start up more slowly, sometimes those things can escalate. And so the impact of those issues, even though they may start off in a fairly benign way, sometimes we need to pay attention to them in terms of looking at the longevity of the symptoms, whether we are coping well, whether we are struggling to do what we do in a daily life situation. And so again, there's severity and there's impact on one's life when we're thinking about whether one needs to get help or not. And part of the presentation today, and the reason I'm here is because we know this is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we think these kinds of opportunities are what we need to do to make mental health understandable to the public and not the scary, hide, in, you know, in the back room, maniacal images that you see on television, none of that. It is a normal experience that people have throughout their lives. Again, depending on the severity and the support structure, it can become more debilitating. But help is available and treatment works. Bottom line is you take nothing out of this presentation. Understand that treatment, good treatment is available and treatment does work. Early identification and prevention obviously is the best route. But we have treatments that are effective and you can get help. So let's move on. I'm going to focus on women, but I need to talk about one man. And that man, for those in the field, um, is Sigmund Freud. Now, a lot of people don't really give a lot of credit to Freud. But quite frankly, I think if Freud were alive today and working in, in the field today, he would be saying a lot of what I'm saying today. Because the fact of the matter is, Freud was the one who understood that what was happening in, in his culture was treatable that there was something going on that needed to be understood. And so he had some ideas as a, as a neurologist that he needed to understand it and help people get over it. So later on in the presentation, you'll see what I think is the translation of Freud's neuroses and all of the unconscious thought. And that's basically what we refer to now as trauma. Okay? Sometimes we're not aware of the impact of a traumatic event on us. So that can be unconscious. And sometimes that may not affect us, and so that's OK. But again, if it's something that's recurring as an issue and preventing us from doing something that we want to do in our daily lives, then we need to understand it. And in Freud's term, we need to make what is unconscious conscious. And that's basically the foundation of most of our talking therapies, someone helping you to see things that you're not able to necessarily see or understand because they're observing. So we've got to give Freud some credit, and I just wanted to make sure I put him up there. Um, by the way, the picture, um, that is actually the couch that sort of became the tradition in psychotherapy where you know, the client needs to lay down and all of that. So if you wanted to know what it looks like, that's what it looks like. So I'm suggesting, though, a broader perspective, and that's the ecological uh, model. And essentially, we can move quickly through this because all it talks about is the importance of a social and physical environment in terms of how things impact us. And that makes sense, right? So we're not in a vacuum. We're not living in a bubble. We have a context in terms of environment. We interact with people. Some of those interactions can be positive. Some can be negative. We have families. We, we want to do things. We have goals, objectives. All of that within our daily living can potentially be stressful or not. But again, we are not, we cannot live in a world where we have no impact from our environment. We are interactive beings. Isolation is probably one of the hardest things for us to deal with as human beings. So we crave that human contact. We need it. It's important and vital to our existence. And so sometimes, unfortunately, those interactions can be negative. And so we need to understand that context, both for the positive and the negative implications that it comes with. And, um, I'm doing, essentially, at the health department, we focus on public health. So you can see the application of that concept within the public health arena, where we know, for example, that your genetic code is now less important in terms of how you live your life successfully than your zip code, right? So that's clearly a contextual impact 
on individuals' well-being and, and life experience. So again, we've got to broaden the context, not just from whatever the individual is, in, in Freud's word, not making conscious, but also what the environmental impact is on an individual in their daily living. And so some of the characters we're going to talk about will, will demonstrate that. This is the model, the, his, the um, standard model. If you, you know, go, go to a psych class, you should see this. And it just talks about the layers of impact that we, we have in that ecological systems model. And so later on, we'll, there'll be presentations talking about children. But clearly, we know that this starts as early as prenatal. A healthy mom is likely to have a healthy mom, and a healthy dad is likely to have greater odds of having a healthy child. And then we know about prenatal can we know all those things. So that context in which a child is even conceived of in terms of being wanted by parents, how they handle that period of uh, pregnancy and how they handle it when the child is born and all of those other things are clearly important. And you'll have a little bit about that in the other presentation. But I wanted to start with our babies. Um, and across the lifespan, we know that there are implications. And so this slide is just meant to give you a sense of some data about the fact that you know, we can see manifestations of need very early on. Unfortunately, most people do not get help. Um, I think I just saw a, a statistic recently that while in one in sort of, I think it's one in 25 individuals nationally are living with some mental illness, 60% of those individuals are not getting any care or treatment, okay? That is not a, full, a fulfilling life. That is not what we want people to do. We want people to know that there is help available and help can be effective. Uh, I'm going to digress for a second. In Prince George's County, for Mental Health Awareness Month, our team, our motto was go big or go home. And so we launched, in addition to all of the standard things that we do, we launched an anti-stigma campaign because stigma is the single most important thing for us to address in terms of people accessing care. And we've got to do that in a, in a number of this one, different ways. This kind of a presentation is exactly the type of thing we need to do to bring this to ordinary, everyday people and help them understand it in that context. Um, so just in case we, and I'm going to do this, and hopefully the other presenters will have more time so they won't have to go through this. But I wanted to make sure we were all having a frame of reference in terms of some definitions. So there's a definition for mental health disorder, and you know that this, that speaks to alterations in thinking, in mood, and behavior. Substance use disorders, uh, dependence on or abuse of alcohol or other drugs. And generically, we talk for, about those two areas as behavioral health. The positive about behavioral health, it also helps us focus on what's really important. How are all of those things affecting you in your interactions, your daily activities, with other people and the things you want for your life. So we don't care if it's a mind disease, we don't care if it's an issue that um, is being managed by medication, talk therapy, relaxation, mindfulness activities, it doesn't matter. Are uh, all of those things helping you do the thing you wanna do every day? Be successful, achieve what you want, decide to go to school, be willing to change jobs, stand up in front of an audience and speak because you're not afraid anymore. Any of those things, we want you to be able to do those things. And that's what we want to make sure we focus on the behavior part because at the end of the day, if there's no change in your behavior and you're not able to do anything else that you wanted to do, the treatment is not effective, right? So that's the goal and that's the integration of both substance use and mental health is why we have the general term because we want those two to be integrated because you are one person. Sadly though, it's still going to be a bit of a challenge around that integration because they're, they're essentially the training for uh, professionals in the field is very different. Uh, substance abuse treatment has actually always been one that has been peer supported. Most of you will know about AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And so there's always been an ex a sense that you can help someone if you've had that experience. But fundamentally what is under that philosophy is the issue of acceptance of what that person is experiencing, right? Because Oftentimes, it is difficult not to blame someone. For example, if someone is, is addicted to, to a substance, to not blame them because, they say, well, you know, you had a choice. You didn't have to do that. And look at all of the terrible things you're doing now that's hurting our family. So there's a blaming that happens and a shaming that comes. Unfortunately, 
while that does happen and that's a natural response, shaming and blaming doesn't help the person get better. In fact, it makes it worse because folks who are using substances aren't happy that they're using them, aren't proud of what they're doing, don't think it's a good thing, but they have an addiction and it's a brain chemistry change. And so whether they wanted to or not, without help, they simply will not be able to change the behaviors that are causing problems in the family. So shaming and blaming is not working. And in peer-supported groups, there is none of that. There is the acceptance that recovery is a process. And during recovery, there'll be moments where people um, are not able to sustain that recovery. And understanding that is a, a supportive experience. But ultimately, people make progress, and they do get better. And they not only recover, but in some cases, thrive. Mental health, however, has focused on understanding the nature of the illness. The field has not been led by peer-supported um, activities. It's been more of a professional, licensure, academic process with training. And so joining those two philosophies of peer support and rigorous academic preparation is really where behavioral health is, is, is seeing its best work happen. So in conjunction with licensed professionals, most treatment involves some peer-supported activity, which is really essential for individuals to know that there's a group of people that understands that experience. I don't believe that it is necessary to understand that experience firsthand to be helpful, but I understand the value of having that for people. And so, again, philosophically, you can make your own decisions. But the evidence shows that peer support in conjunction with traditional treatments is really the most effective. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. So new concept for us, it was not, we didn't talk about trauma. We talked about trauma in medical settings. That, that, that was a standard term. We have, you know, we have shock trauma here. But we're applying that term now to anything that creates difficulty for an individual, not just related only to physical injury. Um, and this is the SAMHSA definition of trauma. And the green areas are highlighted. You probably can't see it as well as I'd like. But they are the ones that start with all of the E's. And it speaks to um, an event or a series of events or circumstances that is experienced by an individual. So again, it is the individual who determines whether something is traumatic for them. But the impact can be either physical or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. And it has to have a lasting adverse effect. Okay? So I may have the same experience Donna has. I may respond to that experience in a very different way from us because of who we are what our resources are, how I perceive that event, how I cope with it. So we can't, everybody is not impacted in the same way. And some people thrive even in negative situations. They do well. They overcome adversity. They, they, there's no residual effect. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach in terms of thinking of mental health. What trauma allows us to do is broaden that context to make sure, again, we understand that sociocultural environment and understand how a particular issue can impact a person. What was also very um, positive about this definition is the last three words where what was brought in was impact on spiritual well-being. So this is the first time psychology and many fields actually put religion, if you will, in that context. And I'm not just talking religion as in an organized issue, but essentially um, how one copes and with those kinds of mechanisms. So your own spiritual well-being. So it doesn't matter if there's no physical injury or any of these other things. If you, your own spirit feels like something is wrong, that's enough because you define your experience. You define whether there's a trauma. And hopefully, if you recognize it as that, you reach out in whatever way that's appropriate for you, and you get some help, right? Because we want you to recognize it, but we want you to do something about it if it's having a negative effect. OK. So I'm going to skip through those because these are, again, standard SAMHSA slides. Hopefully, you've seen them. If you haven't, um, I know there are lots of places who do trauma training and talk about trauma-informed care. And that's where the field is moving. But I wanted to make sure you had them so that in the um, uh, PowerPoint, when you get it, you will have some, sort, some reference documents that you can follow up on. 
So that's all for the academic intellectual stuff. We're going to have some fun now. Because I think the other thing we have to do in mental health is actually be relaxed and have some fun when we talk about these things. It doesn't have to be these dire negative circumstances that are scary and you know, worrisome. So I think Shonda Rhimes is the new Freud. But better than Freud, especially for women, she has done remarkable things in terms of portrayals of stress and coping on television. And if you followed her from the beginning, and I'll show some more slides, you've seen those characters evolve. You've seen the severity and the impact of traumatic events broaden. And she's tackled issues that um, weren't, weren't really tackled at all. Um, you'll also see some socioeconomic and some, some, some um, racial differences in how things are handled, which again talks about that broader context. So um, for those of you who don't know, this is just a quick tutorial for those who are not familiar. And how many people know the Shonda Rhimes shows? Grey's Anatomy. OK, wonderful. Good. And in the, in the audience in the other sites, I'm sure you all know them as well. If not, you're going to have to you know, get, get some old copies and learn all about it. So these are the three primary characters in the three series um, on Thursday night, starting at 8 o'clock. So Grey's Anatomy is on at 8. Scandal is on at 9, and How to Get Away with Murder is on at 10. And well, as I said, the issues get more and more colorful, more and more dramatic, and more and more intense as you watch. And then there's a new show on uh, BBC that I'm going to talk about that's kind of related to Chandra Rhimes. And you know, we went way over in this particular one. But I think it's also important that the old sort of, well, women are just the people who get depressed and, and, uh, and somewhat neurotic. These these, this is showing that women are capable people. All of the characters are talented, strong, dynamic. Um, can I say the word badass women? Yeah, I can say that. I can say that, right? And, and that's what's really great about this. They don't show a, a segment that's, you know, um, having all kinds of negative experiences, had no options. It's not about that. It's about showing that even the brightest, most talented, most capable have moments, right? And have things that go on in their life. And the portrayal of all of that is really what I think is helpful to people to know that, you know, it's, just, it's not just them. So these are the, the um, prime characters. And a little bit of history on Grey's Anatomy. Um, the oldest of the series, the first one, and it started in um, 2005. Um, and so this is what the characters looked like um, in that time, and they've actually evolved over, 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 the t over the years, and so it's pretty interesting. So for those of you who know the show, this is a moment where you can actually jot down some of the things that you know were the traumatic events, because we're going to talk about that now. Um, and we're going to talk about that and identify three of those characters. Meredith Grey, who is um, the Grey that the story, the whole series is about. Maggie Pierce, who actually is her, I guess in the, we call it her half-sister. And Miranda Bailey, who is also a physician at the hospital. Um, and from a capabilities, from a training, from a skill point of view, Meredith and Maggie are basically the same character. Powerful, extremely knowledgeable, very talented, very dynamic. You know, they go in and save lives when you know, there's absolutely no hope. They're, the, you know, they're the, the folks that just make things happen, right? No doubt of any talent in, the, in this group. These are the women, right? And so, each of them faces different things. Um, Richard, who's the next person here, is, now let me see if I remember correctly. This is Meredith's father, Maggie's father, Maggie's father and his relationship to? He had a Meredith, Thank you. <laughs> OK. Good audience participation. Thank you. So going back to those two, though. So generally equal in terms of life experiences, right? Preparation, academic, learning, skills, and all of that. Meredith, and y'all can chime in, 
has had practically every negative life experience happen to her, right? Uh, there was um, some heinous situation in the hospital, um, people with guns, you know, there was lockdown. She lost her husband. Um, join in. Yes, McDreamy was what he was called. Um, she has had every possible thing. And what happens? Meredith bounces back. Now, why does Meredith bounce back? Because this is your coping. Why, does she, why is she able to bounce back? Because she had a lot of resources, right? Meredith was wealthy. Meredith was, well, was, was talented. She was at the top of her game professionally. She had lots of good friends. She had a supportive network. Richard was there. Her mother died. She actually had, um, I believe she was the one who found her mother. I think her mother committed suicide, right? So she's had stuff happen that's bad. But she had lots of coping, lots of support, and lots of resources. Maggie, similarly. Maggie didn't have necessarily the same upbringing, but Maggie's, we don't really know much about Maggie's history because she's a relatively new character, but Maggie has been resilient. And the, the few times we do have seen her family, they seem to be extremely supportive, and we've seen nothing that suggests Maggie hasn't had a wonderful childhood, grew up to a wonderful person. So these are very much parallel characters, except that Meredith has, we've known all about her trauma, and we've known that she can cope. I think there was, remember there was a plane crash and horrific things happened. They were, you know, they were stranded, but Meredith bounces back, okay? So bouncing back is possible, but what about those of us who don't have all of those wonderful positive strengths, right? Because that's this average, this is not the average life by any means. So I want to talk about Miranda. Miranda is now, I think, the chief of surgery um, Miranda is the only character on the show that is probably not a size four, okay? She's also not tall, so she's short and a regular-sized woman. She's regular-sized. I'll show you a picture of her later. But she's short, and she is regular-sized, but she's talented as well. And we didn't know anything about Miranda's family until very recently. But there was one episode of Grey's Anatomy um, where Miranda wanted to apply for a position. She believed she was capable. She believed she could do very well. But a new person entered the picture. This was a woman who wanted to interview for that same job. Ironically, she was coming from Johns Hopkins, so I kind of chuckled about that. Um, and she was tall and blonde and white. So Miranda short regular size, African-American, tall, blonde, white. And now, nowhere did we ever see insecurities from Miranda up until this point. But the woman from Hopkins comes in, and you know she's touring the place as, as these things work. And she's meeting people, and she's talking about all the wonderful things she does, and everybody's impressed and how wonderful that is. And oh, great, blah, 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 blah. And Miranda starts to feel, oh. Wow, look at all the stuff she's done. Wow, they're responding to, I've just been here for 10 years. I've not really left and gone and done anything. Yeah, I did some good things, but she's done this and she's done that. And Miranda actually decides that she's no longer going to apply for the job. Just the presence of that person and the response of her peers and colleagues gives her so much self-doubt that she decides not to apply. Fortunately, and I'm going to come back to the man next to her, and that's why he's up there, because this was focused on women, but we have some men sometimes who do what they need to do. Her husband sat her down and said, listen, girl, uh-uh. And he sat with her and helped her understand all that she brought to the table. And yes, this was a shiny new penny, and that was great, but she had a history of that organization. She knew the people. She knew the issues. She was talented. She was all of those things that he sat and told her about. And she applied, and she got the job. Now, this was not a weak character. This is still a character on par with Meredith Grey in terms of talent and ability. But those moments of self-doubt come even when we have those resources. 
And sometimes having that supportive person who reminds us of who we are beyond the doubt, beyond the worry, beyond the, the, the fear that we'll fail. Because even if she had doubts, she could have said, I'm going to try anyway, right? But she actually took herself out of the race. So she made it possible that she would not even know if she was good enough in her own mind, which would have then potentially been something that she would have, you know, that would have been the beginning of not trying, which is something a lot of us do. Opportunities come up. We're not quite sure we have all of the skills. And we don't say, well, you know what? I'll learn some of those things because I think I have enough to do this job well. We say, you know what? No, I'm not going to do it. And then somebody, sometimes with less skill than us, gets it. And then we're mad. But you got, so you got, to put your, you got to put your hat in the ring, even when you have doubt. But sometimes we worry. So I'm going to keep moving on because we want to talk about, I have some other slides to show you, and I'm running out of time. This is what Miranda actually looks like. Not frumpy, not overweight, not short. Oh, she's wearing high heels, obviously, but still. Okay, so again, image, self-doubt, a, a lot of things kind of can take away from us feeling good about ourselves, but in reality, that's not the case. Okay, scandal, Olivia Pope. I personally have my white jacket. I didn't wear it today because I didn't want you know y'all to know about that. <laughs> but this is, again, dynamic the fixer, the woman in charge, but she has some negative stuff in her family. Father, stone cold killer, let's just, just call it that. Her mother, equally bad, right? So the series chronicles how she copes, and that's by being better than a lot of folks, making some life decisions about who she spends time with or doesn't spend time with. Um, and we see her primarily as a loner a person who really doesn't feel she needs people, occasionally she'll want somebody. And usually, it's a sexual relationship. So no long-term commitments. She'll, you know, she'll pick and choose when she needs that. But for the most part, she's a loner. And I don't know. Th this is not said in any of the story. But again, you kind of see, if you know the um, characters and her family, where that comes from, right? Um, one character in her life who is the personification of all things evil doing is this character named Hawk who literally, um, after a very traumatic event in terms of losing his family, became a very evil person and the person who carried out all bad deeds. So in Hawk, again, this is men. We're not talking about men today, but I'm just going to do a little side note. What can happen when people lose family and lose that support and lose that love and connection? Again, it was shown in, in an example of a man. And so on your sheets, you can kind of talk about it because there was actually a specific traumatic event that we know about with Olivia Pope. Um, I'm not going to say it. Most of you who see the show know it. But the picture is there, and you see the contrast between who she was and what happened. And throughout the series after that, for a long time, we see the um, post-traumatic stress um, syndrome playing out in her memories of those, that event and all of that. And then finally, how to get, with, get away with murder. And that title alone is provocative. And so this character shows the full gamut, and, and we really got the richest knowledge of family, uh, support system, friends, varied coping mechanisms. Just was just flagrant and, and very rich with a lot of information. Some of the characters, um, a, a young man who may or may not be her son, she lost a child, and we know about child loss and the impact of that. Um, a faithful friend, um, back and forth around um, lesbian relationships, and um, the lead character is very sexually active. That's one of her coping mechanisms, and also uses alcohol a lot, again, as a coping mechanism, both of which in an unhealthy way, obviously. Um, has various people who do her bidding and take care of her and do dirty deeds. And so what is really, really, and, and lots of negative experiences, lots of tra potentially traumatic events, and some of them we understand are still having an impact on her. What this show does, though, is it, it talks about some things that we've not talked about that much. And the first thing is, I'm sorry, you can't see very well. This is an image of her with her husband. 
her husband is a psychiatrist, and she eventually, he eventually marries her. And so it shows what can happen when you have an impaired caregiver in terms of a, of, of a helping professional who's not aware of his own needs and his own issues, and, in, it, and eventually they develop a relationship which is extremely unhealthy. Because he was impaired, she was clearly in need because she was his, his client, and it evolved in a way that is unethical, and lots of negative things happened as a result. Cicely Tyson plays her mother, and the portrayal of Cicely Tyson and what she, her function in this um, series is to show um, coping in a cultural context. One of the experiences is the loss of her child. That has been an issue that has plagued her throughout the storylines. Eventually, when it so overwhelms her, she goes home, and her mother takes her through a ritual of literally digging a hole in the ground and putting something that belonged to that baby and then covering it up. And that process allows her to let go of what she had been holding on. So therapy and treatment is not necessarily only sort of standard textbook stuff. There are rituals and practices within cultures that are effective. She's experienced pretty much everything. Um, and so that kind of a street treatment strategy from a mother is there to point out the importance of recognizing culture and having those conversations with people about what is useful within their own culture to augment whatever you're doing in terms of your um, intervention. Um, and so that's it. Let me just quickly show this last slide. New series called Killing Eve, a character who is a killer for hire. And she is merciless. Uh, gets very close up. Favorite thing is to stab people with sharp objects in their eye up close. And then there's the contrast of her being very childish. She organizes birthday parties when there's no reason for it. So the psychological makeup of this character is extremely interesting. And the lead character, who she's now fixated with, is um, Sandra O, oh, who was Meredith Gray's best friend. So I just had to tie that back into Chandra Rhimes. <laughs> so that's it. Wonderful examples. Thank you, Dr. So we, we have a few minutes. Questions. Want to open it up for questions, Mr. Bergoff? If you don't ask any, I will. <laughs> Did you think of these characters in this way, in terms of looking at their coping? looking at the diversity that they have in terms of how they're portrayed? Yes? No, some people had not thought about it. Yeah. I think one of the important class questions to ask, particularly when you're doing an assessment early, is to ask people what they watch. What do you watch on TV? First of all, they're nervous. They don't know what this is all about. You want them to relax a little bit. So you say, tell me what you watch on TV. I think what people watch is interesting. And it kind of tells you a little bit about who they are. Um, I talk, when I do other talks, one of the series I use is the um, Real Housewives series. <laughs> that I need about two days to do. But again, what people watch kind of gives you a sense, and, and you can, and if you understand or know what they're watching, it's helpful to sort of bridge the gap, and because you can make a reference to, well, remember when so-and-so did this? That was an example of what you were talking about. And you saw how she coped, and you recognized that as coping. So can you try that? So that's, I think, one of the ways clinically we can have some conversations that are not scary to people or far into people and so on. Yes, sir? I saw a class where she had what to what to do, when and how intervention to take, which you which you might see these. Yes, absolutely. That wasn't part of the slide. It wasn't part of the slide because I was focusing on generally on trauma, but it absolutely is. When we, but the impact of trauma is, the impact will depend on those things. The slides have more details, which I didn't go over at all, where the who will be talked about. And, you, and the who generally is, if this individual is a known person as opposed to a stranger, that has more impact if they're known if they're family or friend of, fam, of your family than if this is an, a stranger. Okay, good. Substance use? Excellent. 
So you're a great example of integrated behavioral health. <laughs> Fabulous. Excellent. Other questions? OK, so I hope it was helpful. Um, I hope it challenged sort of the way we think about how we work with people. Um, and I hope you got something out of this in terms of something that you hadn't thought about or wasn't aware of before. So thank you for your participation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Duval Harvey. That certainly brings home to real life what we see every day. It really makes it real. Thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce our next two speakers. The, our, the focus will be childbirth, parenting, and depression. Our two speakers will be Dr. Sarah Edwards and Dr. Patricia Woodruff. Dr. Edwards is a board-certified child and adolescent psychiatrist with specialized expertise in early childhood mental health and treatment of complex pediatric trauma-related disorders. She's the medical director of our Child and Adolescent Psych uh, Psychiatry Clinical Service at the University of Maryland Medical S Center, uh, which also includes child inpatient, partial hospitalization, pediatric consultation, and other subspecialty services. Dr. Widruff is a clinical assistant professor um, at the University of Maryland in the Department of Psychiatry. She's the associate director of the University of Maryland Women's mental health program, actually she's, she was promoted to the director, I correct that, and has over 15 years of experience in reproductive psychiatry with a focus on perinatal psychiatric disorders. She's practiced in clinical, academic, and private settings, uh, providing psychiatric consultation, evaluation, and treatment to women during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. She also provides education to obstetrics, pediatricians, and other psychiatrists regarding mental health issues in psychiatry. Please welcome Drs. Edward and Widra. So I'm going to start. Uh, I'm Pat Widra, and thank you for that introduction, Jill. So I have to say, I've already learned something about myself, um, Dr. Duval Harvey. I did not realize uh, that the shows I watch are such a reflection of who I am. I'm watching Call the Midwife right now. Um, <laughs> and as Dr. Rock Beisel uh, said, I focus on the period before, during, and after pregnancy in terms of, of treating women's mental health. And that's a lot of what goes on in Call the Midwife. Um, hadn't thought about that before. So we're going to start. So now that we know a little bit about stress, trauma, coping mechanisms, uh, adaptive and maladaptive ones, um, we're going to talk a little bit about one of the biggest uh, stresses that can happen in a woman's life. Sometimes it can be traumatic, um, and that is childbirth, getting pregnant, having a pregnancy, maybe losing a pregnancy, having a baby, raising a baby. And one of, the, one of the things that can happen during any of that time is a woman can develop uh, problems with depression or anxiety, and it's often overlooked. Dr. Edwards and I wanted to start with a video of some women who have actually experienced postpartum uh, mood and anxiety disorders to kind of give us uh, a flavor for what, what people think about after they've been treated for it and diagnosed and can talk a little bit about what the experience was like for them. Everyone I knew I felt like had the most wonderful experience after they had their baby, but I didn't know how to say, like, I am freaking out. Postpartum depression to me is the disconnect you have with your baby. An overwhelming, uncontrollable sense of anxiety. One of many mental illnesses that can affect mothers. When I got pregnant, I was instantly in a bad mood. In addition to that, I had fibroids, which are tumors that grow in your uterus, and it was really scary. I knew I had postpartum depression from the first time when I went to go and pump my breast milk at work, and I just broke down crying. 
And I actually remember saying to my husband, you know, people kept saying I'd be so emotional and I feel fine. And the reality of the situation was that I was completely emotionally numb. Right after I had the baby, it was my husband's birthday, so I baked him a cake and I invited people over and people were like, what are you doing? But I felt like it was my duty to celebrate his birthday, to try to nurse and then come back and put on a happy face. I believed that every parent around me knew what they were doing and that I was this devastating failure. When my son was four months old and I remember breastfeeding him, but he wouldn't stop crying. And I got face to face with him and I screamed, stop crying. That was probably the moment I realized I needed help. It's a really defeating feeling, knowing that this is something you have no control over. I thought after that moment, I just need to hold my baby. I don't ever want this to happen again. And something has to change. Being a stay-at-home mom was really isolating, but I felt like I kind of came out of it when I started exercising and hanging out with other moms. I started feeling better when I could wake up to my baby every morning. And he just makes everything better and everything worthwhile. To all the mothers going through this, surround yourself with people who get it because you're not alone. I know there's so much pressure right now to be like a perfect mom. You have to be honest. You have to let people in and let them know what you're going through. If you are out there and you are struggling, I want you to know that it is going to get better. I'm a mother and I am vulnerable, but I am capable. And I am fighting every day. And I'm doing the best that I can. And struggling with postpartum depression didn't make me weak, but becoming victorious over it, that's what made me strong. We have lost way too many moms, so please stay with us. Find yourself a community and keep fighting. I wonder if anyone had any, any immediate thoughts about the videos, about the, the women who spoke about their own experiences, anything that they'd any reactions? We'll have a chance to talk a little bit more as we go along. Yes? It made me think um, about my own experience as I had my son. I had twins. And um, everybody was around. I had all this company when they found they were free me, so they you know, came home about three weeks after I did. And all this family and everybody was around me and everything was positive. And then Everyone left, and it was just me and the twins, and I had not one baby crying, like, I had two of them crying. They were on two different schedules because they had two different nurses. They had two different nurses in the NICU, and I didn't get any sleep for three days straight because one of them was always up. And I just got to a point, I just sat there and I just cried and cried, and I thought I was a horrible person that I didn't know how to take care of my own children. But um, luckily I had family support and I had an older sister that had children and, and they helped me get through it. But if I hadn't had that support system, I could have seen my own self, you know, mm -hmm. going, kind of going to a dark place because I was really scared. I, had, I, I, got, I was going through a divorce when I found out I was pregnant. So mm -hmm. I didn't have his support and it was, it was rough, but thank God for peer support and people who care about you that can help talk you through this. And that's what we have to do as women. We have to know to share our stories and to stop. We're, we're known for putting on this brave face and smiling and we're broken inside, but we have to learn to tell others and to speak up and just tell somebody, something is wrong, I need help. And that goes back to the whole idea of what Dr. Deval Harvey was talking about, the context um, and the stigma of mental illness. So let's talk a little bit more about um, how do you know if you have depression or anxiety during pregnancy or after delivery? And these are just some of the questions that, that we use when we're evaluating women to try to figure out um, where on the spectrum of having anxiety or depression they are. And one of the things I think that the women in the videos demonstrated very nicely is that there is a wide range of experiences um, from just feeling uh, really emotional and easily angry to feeling numb um, and anything in between. Um, so having any of these, answering yes to any of these questions doesn't necessarily mean that you have uh, a mood or anxiety disorder during or after pregnancy, um, but that it's a possibility. 
And today, we're hoping to spread the word that depression and anxiety during pregnancy and after pregnancy can be serious, um, and that it can affect your baby, that it can be treated, and that it's not your fault. This is a, a graphic from the Postpartum Support International website, which is a wonderful resource for moms and moms-to-be and people who are living with moms um, who might be having problems with depression or anxiety. Um, they have lots of phone and text lines and resources for anyone, providers, uh, women experiencing uh, or wondering if they're having a postpartum mood or anxiety disorder to reach out with questions or concerns and find out more about what's available to help you. So what if you think you have a postpartum or uh, during pregnancy mood or anxiety disorder? Um, number one, keep in mind you're not alone. As many as 15 to 20% of women have significant anxiety or depression during or after pregnancy. That's a lot. And you know, if, if I asked people to, who've had kids to raise their hands, we'd probably come up with that number, about one in five, one in six. Um, untreated depression or anxiety can affect the entire family. Um, again, going back to that idea of context that Dr. Deval Harvey talked about, um, none of what we do happens in a vacuum. And certainly, a mom with depression or anxiety is, is going to have an impact on her children and other people in the home. Untreated depression and anxiety are never something that you just need to get over. And if anyone says that, you can just turn around and walk away because that is not helpful. Um, it's important to ask for help. And where you get that help can be as variable as the people in this room. Um, you can ask your partner, your family members, your doctor, midwife, a neighbor, or call one of the hotlines or the warm lines to find someone to help you. And to keep in mind for those of us who work with women in the perinatal period that no one knows how a woman is feeling until you ask. And as a, a woman experiencing any of these, no one knows how you're feeling until you tell them. Um, and I think this is an amazing graphic because many of us have felt this, that all you can say when someone asks, how are you doing, is, I'm fine. Um, and fine is not a word that I ever accept um, at face value when someone tells me that's how they're feeling. You can't tell by looking at someone if they're doing okay or not. If you know someone, either as a provider or a neighbor uh, or a mom yourself, who is having any thoughts or worries about hurting themselves or their babies, it's critical to tell someone who cares about you and call for help. And these are just some of the resources. Uh, locally, we're lucky to have the Baltimore Crisis Line. There's suicide hotlines. Um, and you know, again, this, all these resources are available uh, with the rest of the presentation. One of the, organ the postpartum support organization sponsors um, an event called Climb Out of the Darkness. Many of the women experiencing perinatal mood or anxiety disorders feel like they're under a mountain, that they're, they're, they can't find their way out. Um, and this, this graphic and this annual event represents what it feels like for those women to get the help that they need for us to raise the awareness, um, reduce the stigma associated with these. And again, Dr. Deval Harvey suggested, uh, told us that there are treatments, there are effective treatments, and there's a whole variety of them, ranging from uh, peer support to counseling, talk therapy with a professional, medications, changes in what's going on. Um, I mean, again, it, it, you gave us a perfect example of how pulling in other people to help once you realize you're overwhelmed, sometimes it just takes getting regular sleep, getting out, being around people, um, accepting the fact that you need help. Uh, often, more than one type of treatment is needed, and if, if just reaching out and asking your family for help isn't enough, uh, then you might need to ask someone else for help to move kind of along until you find the thing that, that makes you feel better. Sometimes the perinatal mood or anxiety disorder resolves on its own, but we can't count on that. We absolutely can't. Waiting for it to just go away 
um, is, is not going to be, often not going to be a good outcome. Um, some of the things that are easy to do, like we mentioned, getting enough sleep, finding time to exercise, eating regularly, watching what you eat, even though the bag of potato chips sounds really tempting, it's not the best thing to get your mood or your anxiety under better control. Um, asking people just to give me an hour of babysitting so that I can get out and do something for myself. And that's not being selfish, because again, there's that piece of what the mom's going through is going to have an effect on the baby. So for the baby to be healthy and to develop well, the mom needs to be healthy and develop well. And I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Edwards now, who's going to talk more about the depression and parenting. Um, thank you so much. Uh, before we completely transition to parenting and the effect of maternal depression, does anybody have any questions or comments regarding the first section, talking about perinatal depression, anxiety, postpartum depression and anxiety? Thank you so much for sharing. We were really hoping that this would be interactive. Yes, wonderful. Yes, we're going to, hold on, we'll give you one second. I had it on pause there. There you go. I just wanted to ask a question about the postpartum depression. And um, is it a timeline? Like, you know, people always say um, they had the depression right after they had a baby. But what about when the child gets a little older? Is it still considered postpartum depression? And can it happen when they five or six? Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, and I'll answer it with two parts. The first part is that about 30% of postpartum depression actually starts during pregnancy. Um, and so it's not really postpartum depression. The other piece is that untreated depression, whenever it occurs in the first year postpartum, will likely continue. And so it may not get bad enough or you may not uh, know right away and it may be five years out when you have a child going to kindergarten that you've been depressed all along. So if, we, if you were to come to me and say, my child's five, how is this postpartum depression? And we looked back to six months after the baby being born, we would probably be able to identify some depression at that point um, that just progressed because it wasn't treated. Are there other questions? This is not really so much of a question, it is a, a comment. Um, I know this section is about the postpartum depression, but with this uh, warm line that you all put out there, I will, I personally put myself out there, I've used them many times and found them very problematic. And so I'm not gonna get too deep in this because um, maybe there's another section where y'all go more into it. I just feel like just me even as a woman going through whatever, um, that I've had a lot of problems with them. They're not always helpful. And just wishing that, yeah, as far as like the warm lines y'all had put up there, the hot line. No, there was another one that y'all were saying. Yeah, I mentioned like the Baltimore, like, or whatever. So I'm not gonna get too deep in that, but you know, it would be nice if maybe y'all could elaborate or somebody could elaborate more on that later about how yeah. and, and one thing, I think I alluded to is that just like if one treatment doesn't work, you have to move on to another treatment and keep trying until you figure out what works. One warm line might not work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of different resources. Postpartum perinatal mood and anxiety <laughs> disorders are fortunately kind of a hot topic. And so there's more and more out there. And if you bump up against a wall, something that doesn't work for you, something that's making you feel worse about yourself, you know, again, I say move away from that and try something else. Um, and if, if you keep running into those walls, uh, to, to find someone who cares about you to help you. And again, whether that's a family member, uh, you know, someone in your church, someone in your, um, in your school, wherever you are, that you, you have someone that you can count on. Um, so you're right, not every line works for everybody. I just wanted to piggyback on that. I think that's a great example of comments that we hear frequently about all types of treatment. And um, it's really important to listen to yourself. And if you think that it just doesn't fit or feel right, or as uh, Dr. Woodrow was saying, it even makes you feel worse, to move along. There are lots of different types of treatment, lots of different support systems out there. 
And sometimes it does take just trying a couple other ones. But please never give up hope. It's so important. We are a community around that has lots, we have a lot to give, and there's lots of different types of treatment. So I know I work with some families where it's really important that they have their church involvement, that they have other family members with them sometimes when they're at different treatment appointments. And that's great. If that's important and works for you, that's what we need to do. Other people might not like that and want to have something just talking on a phone and not seeing another person. That can be very helpful. So there's not a one-stop shopping. Not everything always fits. But we do have to kind of keep pushing forward to find what fits for you. So thank you so much for bringing that up because we hear that frequently. And we, the last thing we want is for, you know, for somebody to get turned off and say, that's it, I don't, treatment's not going to work because we do know that it does. I saw another hand over there. Don't mean to be negative. However, I have noticed, and I'm saying, I have noticed that I have a, a relative who has a disorder, but I've also have been noticing in her treatment, there are some professionals, in my opinion, are not professionally sound, because sometimes their character, their demeanor, their personality, it doesn't fit the mm -hmm. position, and it shows. Because mm -hmm. I, I can tell when you're professional by the comments they make, how they, the eye-to-eye -eye contact with the individual, that can affect it. Sometimes, oh, I can tie it, I don't be bothered her. Or you come into the office to be seen, and they give a friend, oh, here she comes. That's not professional. I've seen a lot of that in my walk. You know, I'm just saying, that can affect the relationship. Absolutely. Those with people great. with disorders. Just one word, one wrong word, or one particular look or approach can mess the whole relationship. I'm just, oh. That's right. I'll just say to that, a big part of what we are dedicated to is educating providers um, as well. To, to, to talk to OBGYNs and pediatricians and psychiatrists and counselors and social workers and make sure people understand how important every single word is and every single interaction with someone who's already feeling so fragile and overwhelmed. This could maybe be addressed in the second part too, but I think from the video we also saw that often until someone is able to admit that they might be experiencing something, that's when the help starts. And so I guess are there um, strategies for friends or family members to start the conversations early? Because I think even in general asking someone, oh, how's your mental health? That's not something that commonly happens. And so, <laughs> and you know, someone might think, oh, well, why are you asking me that? And so what are some strategies for starting that conversations with pregnant women or new moms? Sure. So one of the things that that we do in all of the um, perinatal programs that we have at University of Maryland, and it is recommended that there be universal screening during pregnancy and in the postpartum for exactly these things, so that it's only 10 simple questions, uh, but it's very helpful in identifying uh, women who may not have thought, you know, that, that this is, that I have this. Um, but that becomes a starting point. So I, I would see someone who scored whatever on this screening tool, and I would say, this really suggests that you're, you're maybe struggling more than you're aware of, or did you know that, that this was, that you were gonna, whatever, that, I don't even know how to say it. Did you know that you, you were having a hard time? Have you talked to anybody about it? You know, to just kind of open the door. Um, so that is becoming more and more standard, um, and again, the, big part of what we do is provide education to clinicians as well to make sure people are comfortable asking the questions, looking for, not just accepting fine as an answer when they ask a new mom. I think we're going to have to move Dr. Along. Woodrow, we also have one question from a remote site uh, for you. Um, the question is, my son went to Vermont to college. I cried the whole way home to Maryland. Is that depression? <laughs> if, if the crying stopped, uh, after a few days after you got home, I would say it's a normal grief reaction. Um, mostly these diagnoses are based on not just a single symptom, like crying for a few hours or even a few days, uh, but how impaired your functioning is uh, as you, you go on from a particular event. 
So we're going to get back to our talk and look at the parenting. We'll have lots of more time for questions. Well, thank you. So now we're going to turn a little bit towards the child and the family as a, as a whole unit and try to talk about how maternal depression does impact parenting and the child. Um, so why is this important? Well, as we've already discussed, maternal depression is very common. It's common during these childbearing years, and it impacts the entire family and children of all ages, not just the babies. So when a parent is depressed, when a mother's depressed, if you think about it, you're not, it's, it impacts your entire being, everything that you do on a daily basis. So how you eat, sleep, interact, you don't have the energy, and it really can compromise your ability to respond in a very warm and nurturing manner to your child, and that impacts their development. We, what we've learned about child development in the brain is really amazing. We know that during the first several years of life, every one second, a million neural connections are formed. I mean, that's incredible for me to even think about. I've sat here and talked for several seconds, and that's millions and millions of connections. And it's so important because these connections are formed. We're all born and we have genes, but as Dr. Duval Harvey had mentioned, we're human social beings. It's these interactions that we have. So it's a combination of the genes that somebody's born with, but most importantly, the interactions with the environment and that parent that then forms all of these connections. We know that these connections are, it's the foundation that later really allow all um, later learning, development, how we deal with stress. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I mean, that's pretty incredible to think that just in the first several years of life, that lays your future foundation, and we know that. I see a little bit of some head shaking. Yes? How, I mean, it's kind of like not something that's proven or disproven kind of thing, but it's something that I think is very interesting. And I, I, I don't know, it just brings me back to that, that, that kind of concept, so, yeah. That's right, it's, it's that, it's not an either or, it's that combination and how important all caregivers are. And so when you're able to be functioning well and uh, able to take care of yourself, which kind of piggybacks on your other comment about how do you start to bring up topics if you're worried about somebody who might be suffering. I sometimes like to put it in context of, you know, you need to be able to take care of yourself in order to take care of your children and families. And so to check in and, and to frame it not so much as there's a problem, but how do we make sure that you're well and feeling well and have as much energy and support as necessary. Let me slip, uh, flip the slide here. So these are some possible negative outcomes that happen to both young children, and I'll show you through the ages, if we are not able to help treat uh, maternal depression. And I, I say maternal, but it's the same within the context of the family. So it's also the moms and the dads, but maternal depression. So in babies, if you're not able to be there and you can't really respond in that nurturing way, you frequently can have problems with the baby feeding. Um, they might not grow well then. They might, you might be too tired to get them to their well care appointments. It might be too stressful. So then those children might not have all of their shots that they need. Then they can become sick. It's really important that when we're interacting with children, um, again, we develop based on these interactions, and we call that like a serve and return, uh, and return interaction. So if you think about it, a baby cries, and the mother comes up and nurtures, goes ahead and helps to soothe the baby. Maybe the infant then starts to coo, and the mother you know, responds in delight. It's that back and forth communication that helps to make all of those good brain connections. 
We know, interestingly, that children, right from the beginning, need to hear lots of words. So we actually coach parents to kind of be like a sports broadcaster and describe everything that you're doing. So you have a baby right there in the kitchen, and it's the morning time, and you'd want to be able to say, like, OK, mommy's now going to make some breakfast. I'm pouring myself cereal. Oh, look at this big red box of cereal. Look how colorful the Fruit Loops are. And you have to describe, and you describe what it sounds like and tastes like. And that baby is taking this all in. And it's so amazing that our brains are making these connections. If you are tired, exhausted, depressed, anxious, you're really not able to do that. And so you're not going to be talking as much. And then that impacts their speech and language delays. Oh, sorry. That impacts how, there's, how their language is starting to form. And what happens if you don't have good language skills? Well, it can lead to behavioral problems. If you can't communicate and get your needs expressed and your needs met, you become frustrated as a, a young child. And so these children are going to have more likely have problems with behaviors. Uh, and then you don't have as much success in um, preschool, kindergarten. And then it starts to leak into uh, elementary school. So you don't have that same level of academic success, potentially. And then when we start getting older into adolescence, you can, the children themselves then start to have more mood and anxiety problems. Maybe they don't finish school. And that puts you at risk for you know, being around friends that might not have the best influence. So then you can make choices with substance use. And so it kind of has this big overall effect. And it's hard to think that just maybe how you're feeling and interacting right when that baby's first born could trickle down and have such long-lasting effects, but it's possible. And so that's why we really want to bring awareness to this. I love this slide here because it highlights that Depression and anxiety during and um, after birth are really associated with all of the negative intergenerational consequences for parents, infants, and really society. So if you look at the beginning of the cycle here, you have the parental depression, and then you're not able to have that warm, nurturing, caregiving from the beginning, and you have poor bonding with a child. Has anybody ever heard the term like attachment? bonding or attachment. I heard um, before one of the best descriptions of that. And attachment is kind of like our own emotional immune system. So we have an immune system that helps us. So when we get exposed to germs and illnesses later on, we're able to fight them off. Well, that attachment that you have with your parent or your caregiver sets you up so that you can handle stress later on in life, that you can handle regulating your emotions and your actions. So without that, it makes it really difficult. So we talked a little bit about some of the negative childhood outcomes. And then we know that if you don't have the same level of school achievement, and you've had stress, and you could have more traumatic experiences, then unfortunately it does put you at risk for increased future health problems heart problems, obesity, diabetes, things like that, then those genes are then passed down to the next generation. And it can be this cycle. But I don't want anybody to lose hope. There's hope because we know that treatment is there and it does work. Many people have brought about, um, raised the issue of how it can be hard to find treatment that you feel is supportive and fits for you, but it's out there. So I, I keep on encouraging people um, that sometimes it just takes trying to figure out what works for you. We know with young children and infants, there's many types of um, treatment. We can do the parent-child treatment that works, and you have groups, and it can help build and strengthen that attachment and that bond. There's different family groups. There's individual treatment, many different types, and it's out there. So on that note, I'd like to, again, try to involve some participation and see what sort of questions or thoughts or comments. We got some, great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, basically, this part, you answered uh, some of the questions, the one question that I did have, which was um, I wanted to know what was the probable cause of if the parent or the child did not receive help. If she went, you know, when you go through that time period of that postpartum depression mm -hmm. and you never receive help and the child never receives help, but part of that was answered in this slide right here, but the other part wasn't for the child it was, but not for the parent. So what happens if the parent doesn't receive help? Right, because yeah. we know that a lot of that really goes on. Absolutely, unfortunately, it does exist. And so if I go back to this slide, we know that untreated depression, anxiety, can lead to many diff different types of problems. Um, you're also going to be able to struggle with, it puts you at risk for future health problems, right? So problems with your heart, your blood pressure, diabetes, um, puts you at risk for substance use issues. Because if you're not feeling well and are stressed and maybe aren't able to handle other types of stress in a different way, you could choose things like substance use. So it puts you at risk for many of those problems as well. So for the child, Again, it, it's not a guarantee, but we know that untreated illness does lead to those potentially poor outcomes. Same thing for the parents. Um, you know, you're not likely to have the same amount of fulfillment in your life as far as doing the job that you want to do and being happy and being available to the rest of your family and for you to feel fulfilled. So that's, that's a great question. Yes. I'm just going to ask you to get really close because we have remote sites. Yeah, is anything being done to expand uh, kind of access to screenings for new moms? Because I've had two kids and I've had four years, and I don't think they have any screenings are immediately after birth. And then at my six week follow up. So, my question is about the expansion to access to screenings. Sure. Do you want? The question is if uh, we are working on improving and increasing the amount of screening done on moms who are pregnant and postpartum because the person asking the question was screened at immediately after birth and at six weeks postpartum. So the answer is yes. Uh, when I see women in the, the OB program here at University of Maryland, uh, they are routinely screened at their postpartum visit, which is anywhere between two and six weeks. Um, they are also screened in both pediatrics with every well baby visit and in family medicine if they bring their child there. Um, and if I am seeing someone and treating them myself, I will, I will reassess that same screen every time to kind of just get another piece of information about how they're doing. So uh, again, in terms of provider education, that is a big part of what we are devoted to is to to help, you know, to, to make sure everyone knows whether it's, uh, you know, a NICU social worker or a family practice doc who's doing well baby visits or a mother's one year postpartum exam is that those are all reasonable times to, to screen and you, you just can't screen too much. Um, it gets a little silly if it's every week, but um, we don't want to miss the woman who's been depressed for five years and doesn't realize it until she's taken her, her son to school um, for kindergarten. So yes, we are working on that. Question. We have a question remotely, but I think you may have just answered it. The question is, how much emphasis is placed on prepartum, well, prepartum depression? How is this assessed and at what point in the pregnancy? So actually before delivery. So that varies somewhat from practice to practice. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology does not have specific guidelines at this point or specific recommendations about when that screening should happen. They are starting to get on board with that. Um, and so hopefully in the not too distant future, we will have routine screening. Um, my personal recommendation, my professional recommendation is uh, at a first pregnancy visit, first OB visit. Um, and then again in the third trimester at the very least, and then again postpartum. 
Um, and if you get three screens and everything's good, then that's, that's a good start. We have a fabulous questions uh, from St. Joe's Me uh, Medical Center. Um, do men experience postpartum depression? Uh, they do not physically carry a baby, but experience the same new parent emotions. Are there resources for healthy new dads? Can dads carry this depression into further years like the mom? Take it away. Um, absolutely. So I, I scrolled back to this one slide where it does mention here that 4% of fathers are depressed during their child's first year of life. So absolutely. It's a huge... Can you hear me? It's a huge change when a child is born. It's wonderful, it's joyous, but it brings a different dynamic to any relationship, as well as it's stressful. And so absolutely, fathers can experience and do experience um, depression and anxiety. So this says up to four, this says 4%, but my feeling would be that that's probably lower than it really is. Um, I think men sometimes aren't. Um, is willing to seek help, so I bet that number is based on individuals who are seeking help or admitting to it on some questionnaires, and that's some of the ways in which we gather that data. And just as an example of one resource for dads having depression in the postpartum period is Postpartum Support International does have a whole section dedicated to that, and they, they do uh, presentations. Uh, I'm not sure with what frequency, but if you were to go to the Postpartum Support International website, you could see um, information about that. There's another question. Um, based on what you stated about genetics, is depression hereditary? I noticed signs of depression in my father. He was never diagnosed. My brother was clinically depressed in his 20s and 30s, and my daughter was diagnosed last year at 16 with depression and anxiety. So again, the question is, is it hereditary? Sure. Um, we absolutely know that a lot of different types of mental illness like depression and anxiety is hereditary, that there's a greater likelihood. Part of that is because of genes, and sometimes part of that is because of uh, the environment. So if you're raising a child in a similar environment to which you were raised, but yes, we do know that there's a strong genetic component in some uh, mental illness, uh, specifically things like schizophrenia, ADHD, these, those have very high heritable um, numbers or values that we, we are able to determine how likely you are to pass that gene. Do you want to add anything to that? Again, to go back to Dr. Duval Harvey's uh, discussion about context and sociocultural influences, um, if, if you, you have a 10% component of depression that is genetic and you are raised in an environment that is not providing you with the support and the resilience to uh, develop as positively as you can, then that kind of magnifies the risk of developing depression. So we also think about the heritability of uh, how, you, how you live. Uh, we talk about int intragenerational transmission of trauma, um, so that if, if you as a mom experience traumatic events and experiences and have uh, difficulty forming the bonds you need to form with your children, those children are more likely to experience those same kinds of symptoms. And so we really look at intervening as early as we can in pregnancy to try to help every mom be as well as she can when the baby is born. Um, and if not during pregnancy, after pregnancy, if not after pregnancy, when they're two or three or the, the kid goes to daycare and starts having some problems that hadn't been identified before, those are all points at which we can intervene. And so the genetics is a small piece of it, um, but then there's a whole nurture piece that, that also comes into play. Any final questions for Dr. Edla Widrup? Resource. On here? Last page. And so here are some additional resources. Um, our University of, oh my gosh, that's a wrong phone number. <laughs> uh, the Women's Mental Health Program is 3286091. Oh, that is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. That's fine. But there's also more information on our programs outside. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Widra and Dr. Edwards. That was great. Um, I want to thank our remote sites for sending in questions. That's uh, great. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Uh, the restrooms are around the corner. There's refreshments in the back of the room, and we'll convene, reconvene in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>